And we're live and recording here with Jono Alderson from Yoast. I had uh, very lucky to have the best speakers today, so I'm happy because I, I really like uh, I really like uh, Jono a lot. And for those of you that who don't know much about him, he currently manages uh, special projects at Yoast, and he was previously a principal consultant at an SEO agency called Distill. Prior to that, he was head of multiple things like digital and insights at SEO platform Lindex and head of SEO at uh, 26. He's a digital strategist, a marketing analogist, and a full stack developer, which is an odd combination, by the way, with two decades of experience in web development, SEO analytics, brand, and campaign strategy. I'm very happy to introduce uh, him to you guys and just excited to hear your keynote. So I'm just going to let you have the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a nice intro. Um, right, I'm going to attempt to see if I can work out how to share my screen now. That's going to be interesting. So we're going to do that and that. Oh, look at that. First time. Absolute magic. Well done. Um, what we won't tell you is the amount of problems we had getting the audio working. Um, but we'll pretend everything is running very smoothly um, here in my little cobbled together home office. How is everybody? Um, you've got a lot of content to get through over the last and upcoming hours. So thank you very much for having the patience to um, to sit through this triple. Um, so where do we start? I want to talk about um, some big trends I see unfolding in what I think the future of the web looks like. And I think these are really super important. And it's a bit more technical than stuff I would usually talk about. I like to think a lot about the strategies and the kind of big brand direction stuff but there's some really interesting tactical stuff happening specifically around schema and structured data and what google are doing with it and what all of us need to be doing about it so let's dive in um i am an seo nerd and that is because search is how we discover brands and products and how we as consumers make decisions i think we cannot uh, underestimate how important that is and the role that search has on every decision all of us make day to day whether it's what our favorite flavor of crisps is or which car we should buy or how we should get to work all of these things are influenced by search and by search engines search is a big part of where we choose to spend our time and money. Um, and it's driven by very commercial forces. Thank you for adjusting my screen for me. I forgot to do that. Um, so this makes it a really interesting competitive field to play in and explore. Ton is suggesting in the chat that I should talk faster because I've only got 19 minutes. He's drawn after me. Now he's very, very good. Let's, um, yeah, let's speed up. Let's give Ton um, plenty of space. So let's go double speed. Um, so this is me. I'm interested in technical SEO. I'm really obsessed about fixing improving and optimizing the underlying architecture of websites. Because um, I think that quite often delivers some, a ridiculously outsized result compared to, say, doing content marketing and link building and that sort of stuff. So I spend a huge amount of time looking at how websites are built and how they work or how they don't work in many cases. But I also wear a bunch of other hats. I'm a developer, an analytics geek, um, and a digital strategist. Um, I've worked with some of the biggest companies in the world um, who want to um, build really robust long-term strategies when it comes to SEO and digital marketing. Now, to do that, they need to understand what direction they should be going in. They need to make good decisions, sound investments, future-proof their tactics, and so on. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about where the web is going and what it might become. And a lot of that is informed by the machinations of companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so on. So I keep an eye on what they're up to very, very carefully. For the last two years, I've worked for a company called Yoast. Um, hopefully, some of you are familiar with our products. We're best known for an SEO plugin for WordPress, which runs on somewhere around 11 million websites, which is pretty insane. Um, but we're also very involved with all sorts of things going on on the open web, as well as having software for other platforms, we provide SEO consultancy, yada, 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 yada. A big part of my job is essentially R&D, research and development, and making sure that what we're building next is right for the future. Um, where we can create this world where everybody's content is discovered and found and indexed and consumed, et cetera, et cetera. And as part of that, I have lots of conversations with people from Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, and so on, um, and all sorts of people from within the WordPress ecosystem and the SEO ecosystem about their platforms, technologies, challenges, and their visions of the future. Why is any of this interesting? It's interesting because I see a theme developing, and I think I have a somewhat unique perspective and angle to see this from. Um, the consistent theme is a focus on the importance, challenges, and implications of connected data on the web. Now, I can tell you that Google, Amazon, and others are obsessed with structured data. They're in an arms race to encourage the creation, connection, and utilization of structured data. 
They believe that winning that will give them a competitive advantage in search, in voice, and across their ambitions for the whole internet of things. Um, their existing adoption is already radically changing what it means to search and to complete tasks and to transact online. I'll show some examples shortly, um, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. That's why I've spent essentially the last 18 months or so living and breathing structured data and schema.org markup in particular, which I'll go into in a bit more depth. So I want to tell you about what we built, um, what I think the implications are and what happens next. To understand what happens next, I want to walk you through a little bit of how Google used to work. Um, bear with me, this is a bit 101, but it's important for a foundation. Google fundamentally at its heart calls the web. It follows links and it passes the content it finds on pages. Now I'm focusing on the organic side of that ecosystem rather than the paid ads world because they work very differently. And for me, the paid side is much less interesting. Um, from the content Google finds, they attempt to derive meaning. They identify entities, concepts, relationships. Um, and they attempt to ascertain whether the, the information is true or accurate, for example, based on correlations with other data they have. And they'll compare that data with other sources, such as Wikidata, Yelp, and so on. They do a whole bunch of other parsing, processing, sanitization, and so on and so forth. Once upon a time, the way you would influence that would be by trying to describe to Google what your pages were about. And to do that, you'd use meta keyword tags, anchor text, Maybe you cheat a bit and put white text on white backgrounds until you got caught. But essentially, the better you described your page, legitimately or otherwise, the more visibility you could get in search engines. Now, there's a huge amount of nuance beyond that, and only more over time. But that's essentially been how SEO and search engines have worked for the best part of 20 years. That was just the beginning. Google's vision was never to provide a list of links. It was to be a personal assistant. They refer to it as the Star Trek computer which is smart, connected, and integrated enough just to solve people's problems. A list of links which I can click on is a failure of them to provide something better. And in the last few years, we're seeing a, a breakthrough in Google's mission to provide solutions rather than just search results. More recently, when you search, you probably started to see panels and results like this. It's not a list of links to pick from. A list of links that requires the user to think that and introduces cognitive friction and load. They're trying to expose the answer in the results page to solve your problem in situ. But let's be critical of this. This isn't great, certainly not compared to what they want to deliver. It's not rich, it's not interactive, it's not fluid. It has no context, no interactivity. It's essentially just an expanded advert. It goes some way to helping me validate that if I click on it, that page will have the information I want. It doesn't solve my problem in situ. It doesn't walk me through step by step or help me understand what I need, how long it will take, or other variables. What they want to deliver are experiences like these. Cards, tools, answers. The ability not only to answer the question, but to do the thing. To listen to the podcast, to assess a deep view in an app, to buy tickets, to book a table, to compare nuanced product information. To do that, they extract the content from the pages or platforms. Now, there are some interesting economical, political, and social ramifications to this as they break our established paradigms around content production, marketing, monetization, as they source and share people's content without citation, but that's a different talk entirely. More practically, this creates a world where the role of websites diminishes. A world where Google changes from a portal to other websites into the platform where you start and end your journey. For us, that means we need to start thinking about our websites less as CMSs and places to send traffic to, and more as data repositories and libraries of information and actions which can be exposed in different formats into other systems than just as web pages. When you look at these, where these kinds of featured snippets and rich experiences occur, that for people who are looking for information or specifically for trust, and they'll get it directly in and from Google. They'll never visit brand websites. This is a study from a tool, an SEO tool called Ahrefs. Some of you will be familiar with it. You can see these kinds of searches are where people start their journeys. The 70% or so of people who begin their customer journeys use words like best versus can, list, top, and so on. Now, relatively few of these people are searching for specific transactional terms. They're not clicking on a site and buying something. They're not picking a product but they are starting to consider how they might solve their problems. Now, it doesn't matter if you're not into SEO or if you grow your audiences offline or if you only advertise on TV, because consumers and customers who are researching in your problem space now have their entire product journeys contained within and arguably controlled by 
Google's ecosystem. Incidentally, over 50% of all searches now don't result in a click. This is data from um, Spark Toro and Anne Fishkin. Um, take it with a pinch of salt. But the premise is that over time, there's been an increasing percentage of people and clicks, 47% um, in 2017, 44% in 2016, over 50 now, whose needs are met in the search results. 70% of all purchase decisions start with search. 50% of those never get beyond search. We're all still focusing on building websites and trying to optimize click-through rate and get people to convert. Half of your audience aren't getting there. We're playing in the wrong space. This is Google's end game. There's tons of evidence that this is their big strategic play for the next few years, to become that Star Trek computer, to just solve problems for people's queries. Things like the original Google Now research, where they surveyed people to find out what they didn't search for to make useful services. Places where they could proactively search and answer problems before people knew they had them are all starting to become the norm. All this is baked increasingly into the heart of Android and Chrome and beyond. However, many of the systems behind these processes and this ambition still just depend on crawling the web, extracting content and trying to understand it well enough to transform it into something useful. Even with all of their machine learning capabilities and enormous corpus of data, all of their processing power, they're limited by their inputs. They've got as far as they can with their current approach. They can't create the Star Trek computer by just crawling the web and assessing content. They can collect all of it, but to realize their, dis um, their vision, they need to be able to understand it. And that's not always so easy. Take this example of a recipe on the web, on a random food site, there are millions and millions like this. How long does this recipe take to prepare? It's ambiguous. The information is conflicting, unclear, incomplete. That makes it really hard to use in the kinds of rich experiences which Google wants to deliver. They can't take this information and show it in situ in the search results and walk you through a step-by-step -step process because they don't understand the information. The content isn't good enough. Specifically, it's not structured enough. Now, this isn't a machine learning problem. It's not something that you can solve by throwing more CPUs and manpower at. It's a precision problem. And there are many examples like this. Google can extract the topics and entities, but will struggle with the detail. And it's the detail they need in order to be able to solve problems in situ. This is critically painful for them. There are problems with just having large scale content extraction and entity identification. They can tell me what that recipe is about. They can even tell me which ingredients are in it, but they can't get it right enough to use it. And most of the content on the web isn't structured enough. It's in text and HTML and paragraphs in some kind of content management system, muddled up in words and paragraphs and pictures. It's rare for publishers or editors to manage their content with precision or to structure it in nice, neat little database tables. That's why structured data is the next war. Why they're investing huge amounts of resources in technology and education and experiments, because they know that they are losing. They see potentially billions of dollars of future revenue and they're competing heavily with Amazon and others, others who have bigger developer ecosystems and more effective um, and more good data market share and faster processes and other ways of working. Google's approach relies on essentially reading out the content they find, and it's not very good. And it's not just the search results experience that's changing. Google are increasingly trying to remove the need to search. If they know what I'll need in advance and they can provide more and more scenarios where they can infer this, they can just solve my problems without the friction of searching. Search is an unpleasant, unnecessary intermediary stage that they want to get rid of. To do that, they need to understand the content. They know all of this. None of this is scary or unknown. They know there are problems with the current approach, which is why in 2011, they got together with Bing and Yahoo and Yandex, Yahoo, where are they, um, and created Schema.org, a standardized, structured way of describing the properties of things. Imagine a product, it has attributes like a cost and reviews, and each of those reviews has an, old, um, an author and a star rating, and that author has a name and an email address and so on. If I can describe my product content using schema.org in this way, then Google can understand it well enough to be able to use it and feature it in voice and so other places, and in particular directly in the search results. They can determine which audiences and solutions it might be a good fit for. They can understand. Um, in 2011, that was a long time ago, and they didn't really get a huge amount of traction because the markup mechanisms and methods of microdata and RDFA they promoted were complex and brittle, and they largely failed. And over time, their adoption and preferences changed to JSON-LD. 
Now, describing our content in JSON-LD, you can see an example in the back, is pretty straightforward. It allows us to more easily construct representations of our content, but it's critically not connected to or reliant on the underlying HTML structure. That reduces some of the fragility and allows site owners and developers to more easily describe their pages. I can add a block of code like this and say, my page is about a store called Middle of Nowhere Foods, and it's open on these days. This stuff is straightforward, but still has problems. They can ask people to provide them with that markup and they can provide them lots of guidelines and tools and they can even be reactive and adaptive and launch new standards. However, there are problems. This is how many of the systems and project content management platforms on the web handle and support structured markup. Um, they typically allow you to say this page is about a thing. This is a screenshot from Rank Math, which is actually one of um, our competitors in the WordPress SEO space. Um, and I think they're doing it wrong. And this allows you to say this page contains an article and then it outputs the kind of schema you need to describe that article and sure Google can understand and use it. And that will unlock all of today's shiny toys, rich cards and interactive experiences and so on. But when you look at what Google are trying to achieve, it needs data which is deeper than page level. Tomorrow's shiny toys require a more sophisticated integration. Why is that? Because the web is more than just things on pages. This approach limits you to saying this page contains an article and an organization and a website and a breadcrumb structure and six comments and five persons and so on. It's much harder to say this page is about an article which was written by a person called John Smith, who's an employee of Acne Corp, who are the publishers of this website. And by the way, that's also the same John Smith as the person who wrote the responses to the comments which are associated with the article. What I'm describing is a graph, truly linked data. And none of the solutions out there go that deep. They just talk through what's on a page. Unlocking the next level of capabilities and building tomorrow's web requires that we describe those relationships, that we must build a graph. This is another rank math screenshot, just to bully them a little bit. Here you can configure the JSON LD output for a book. Um, but what happens if I also sell that book? That book is now a book and a product. That's valid schema, it's semantically sound, but how do I describe that? And how do I describe that the book is manufactured by a different organization than the one selling it? I can add schema for a book and product and organization on the page, but how do I know that those books are the same thing or the relationship between them? Not to mention that's a lot of duplication of content and effort. The data isn't linked. It's just a content inventory. So when I say, how do I change a tile or how do I make this recipe? All Google can do is read out the bits of things. This approach of picking what the page is about and populating content fields doesn't work because the whole point of structured data is to describe the nuance and relationship between the entities. And I don't think that's fixable. Imagine the complexity of a user interface designed to visualize and configure that kind of information. You can't rely on users to manage this accurately or at scale for all the same reasons that they don't currently accurately describe the timings of their recipes. Manually authoring and maintaining rich schema at scale is impossible. All of this upsets me because the next generation of things we could build is awesome, but neither content management systems nor users can reliably deliver that. Maybe if you had infinite budget and resource and training and development overheads, you could roll your own solution, but that pushes small independent publishers and retailers out of the search results, which isn't a good thing. So about 18 months ago, I set myself a challenge. I said, how can we enable everybody to have rich graphs which represent their content and businesses and so on? How do we do this automatically invisibly and perfectly just based on users' content? And how do we make this scale and interoperable beyond Yoast and beyond WordPress? I think we've done it. Some of you may already be playing with it and using it without even realizing it. What I really want to talk to you about today is a few of the challenges we went through to create this in the next five, six minutes or so, and then encourage you to go and explore and build on it and to take it further. Um, this was obviously an insane challenge to take on. It's hugely complex and it has some massive challenges in it. I'll walk you through some examples of the pitfalls and minefields you encounter when you start to really dig into schema. Um, the first of which is that schema.org, which is all the documentation on what schema is and how it works, um, is pretty limited. It has extensive documentation on all of the possible structures and properties of things, like a product has a price and can have reviews. Um, and it has advice on the implementation of things and complicated examples. Um, 
but it's limited when it comes to the relationship between stuff. It describes how to represent an individual product, but says nothing about how to describe the relationships between multiple entities, which is fair. That's not what that documentation is meant to do, but it means that in the real world, in the nuance of how do I describe that this product is also a book that has an author and a publisher, there's lots of debate and discussions, but there are no rules. There are stale discussions on forums and nuanced details spanning back years since the last comments. So beyond just copy pasting individual bits of markup, you've got to work out how all this fits together and stitches together yourself. On top of that, Google's rules are particularly finicky. Let me give you an example. Um, an article must have an author and a publisher. Otherwise, it's not a valid author, uh, not a valid article. But a publisher can't be a person and must also have a valid logo. Oh, and local businesses can't have split opening hours within a single day. The logo of a news article has different requirements in terms of dimensions and formats than one from an organization. But what if that's the same organization which can only have one logo? And what if the organization who publishes the website also published the news article? Now we need multiple. You see where this is going. If the article is in AMP format, the dimensions must be different still. There is lots of trial and error and fiddling and trapping across this, and none of it is well documented. And it is radically inconsistent across Google. There are different teams responsible for different bit snippets and changing standards. An article must have a main entity of page property, but FAQ markup must have main entity properties on the web page. That's the opposite approach. It doesn't sound like a huge difference, but these are literally back to front when it comes to implementation. They don't play nicely together and they sure as hell don't get back to your emails. The signposting in tools is unclear. This is the um, rich snippet testing tool saying um, people complaining on our comment form because when you're missing optional fields, optional fields like a recipe doesn't strictly need an image, but Google flags it as an error. Their language is incredibly unclear, creates different interpretations, all sorts of mess. There are also poor standards management and lots of gray areas. This is um, an FAQ rich snippet being featured in the search results, which contains HTML links, not just any links, but an affiliate link. That's an affiliate link of a brand making money from and directly within Google search results. Now, according to schema.org, an FAQ answer can only be in text. That precludes HTML markup and links. This whole thing is poorly and inconsistently managed. And Google's tools and those of others are also wildly inconsistent. Their structured data testing tool gives you different information from the rich results testing tool. There's some overlap, but they give you very different wording. And Google Search Console tells you where you have certain types of results, but does so with some different debugging, and so on and so on. One of the really interesting challenges um, is that as you start to create these rich graphs, you're limited to the idea, you're limited to working within Google's paradigm, which is that one page should have one primary topic, a focus, a keyword, a, uh, a key topic. And that concept is very much tied to the heart of how their system works, which means for the kind of graph we construct, we need to consider the directionality of the relationships between things. What's a trailing edge? What's a leading edge? What's at the center of those relationships? This is why it's not enough just to say this page contains an article. We have to describe all of this nuance. And as you do this, you realize very quickly that schema.org only describes the possible types of things, not the logic that surrounds them. And Google's documentation um, and their specific requirements often conflict and don't line up to the schema.org rules. That leaves us missing a vital ingredient, a set of instructions based on context. There are no guidelines that say, for example, if an organization has a logo which is X size, but the article doesn't have an author, and if it's Tuesday, do X instead of Y. And I think that's one of the really big things that nobody had solved, because it's really, really complex. Not least of which because websites are made of multiple systems. Your platform, your themes, your plugins, your widgets, your add-ons, your JavaScript, your tech management systems, the child relationship, child parent relationships it has with other brands and websites and products and so on. A lot of the things you'd want to put into your sites and your content graph live in different systems. Plugins and extensions are particularly challenging. One piece of your website may add product scheme. Another may be responsible for managing your local business opening times. These bits of markups have no way of communicating or integrating. And there is no universal way for them to declare their schema or to specify that this product is sold by a particular local business. These bits all sit independently. The way you cross-relate entities is via their ID, a single persistent arbitrary string, usually the URL of the thing, but not always. 
Now, that's really inconsistent in Google's documentation and so on. Breadcrumbs behave completely differently to any other object for no reason other than that's the way they built it. So people make their own syntax for IDs and they create a mess. If we want all of these systems to work together and all of these things to communicate, we need a standard format for consistent IDs. This makes it really important because when Google consumes and extracts structured information from pages, they never actually pass it as a graph. Different teams who represent Google's different interests in different areas just look to lift specific bits of schema from certain pages. Incidentally, we, I'm not going to get into that, but it's a particular set of nightmares as we fight to work it out because they don't support cross-linking between things. Now, this is the real challenge and the key thing to understand is the part of the point of linked and structured data is to build representations of data which span multiple pages and properties and domains and mediums. Google does not allow you to do that. They don't support the idea of cross-referencing things between pages. You can't say this article was written by the author represented on that URL, where that URL has a nice graph about that author. You have to build the whole graph of everything you want to represent on every page. So this article was written by this organization, which is part of this website, which has this breadcrumb nav, et cetera, which is published by this organization. And Google's key employees and people who talk on Twitter, et cetera, don't understand this in depth when they give out bad information. All of the solutions and processes out there which allow you to copy paste bits of schema onto your pages are doing so incorrectly and incompletely. You have to describe the whole graph on each page. And furthermore, as you construct that graph, depending on the other properties and its relationships, bits of it might change. A page which contains an FAQ list becomes an FAQ page, which now contains an article. An authored article about a product stitches in a completely different way to a normal web page about a product. You need to pass and process and analyze the whole graph in order to construct it. Let me give you a magic wand. This is a huge challenge until January last year when WordPress launched the new Gutenberg editor, which some of you will be familiar with. I won't go into it in depth, but the principle is that you author and construct your content in blocks. Everything is a block. Everything is inherently structured. A paragraph is a block. A list is a block of blocks. Our team were heavily involved in um, some of the underlying work in Gutenberg to make sure that there was enough abstraction in there in order to um, achieve some of the original schema.org goals, to only have to create the content once. Now, as a content author, as you write a how to change a tire guide or a how to cook an egg guide, you're using blocks which are inherently structured. Now the content is automatically populated with schema and in the background, um, all of your structured data happens automatically. Fast forward, fast forward. Um, that gave us the framework. We still needed all the business logic about what if X, but not Y. Six, nine, 12 months later, we have done it. I'm really proud to say that I think that we've solved all of these problems and paved the way for something really freaking exciting. Um, specifically, the 11 million people who are running Yoast SEO on WordPress already, if you view your source code, have a complete, robust, um, coherent graph on every page of your site, which describes the relationship between your organization and your website and the authors and so on and so forth. And we have a complete set of API documentation and information. What's more important than that is that the whole of it is open source. All of the nuance between how individual nodes behave and all the business logic and the awkward edge cases about what happens if my author doesn't have a name, how do I represent the color of my tire if it's a Thursday, all of those things are solved and documented. And whilst the, the big good news is you've got all of this in WordPress and Yoast, you can go and use this logic and build your own solutions and systems. Um, you can also customize the stuff if you're running WordPress using our API, I'll skip forward a bit because we're right at the end. Um, it looks something like this. This is incredibly dense, and this is just a snapshot of describing um, an authored article on our website, because there is so much information here about who wrote it and its format and its structure and so on. Do, 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 do. Um, skip some of this, skip some of this. Yeah, in fact, I'll go back to that one. You can see the level of depth here as we describe everything on that page in a single graph. We say, um, this is a web page that is part of a website which has these properties, which is joined up to stuff. Hello, it's talk. You just joined. This is indeed live. Ton is up in two minutes. Um, we keep going. With that. It's got a primary image. It's got these breadcrumbs. It's got the relationships between all of these things. You cannot do this manually. And even if you copy paste all these bits of things in manually, you lack those relationships in the way to cross reference them. It is really integral that you create one coherent, consistent graph. And this is the only way that you can do that. Where were we? Why can't I now skip forward a slide We're right at the end? Um, the way we do this as a core principle, if you're interested in particularly nerdy, is we have a concept of a base script. 
which describes the very foundation of a graph and the relationship between an organization, the website, and the people on it. And we build on that and we transform it and we expand it and everything relates to everything else. Very, very nice. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Um, and then you can see as a user, when you're doing things like writing a um, how-to guide, um, now you don't need to worry about the schema and the structured markup because um, all of it happens in the background because we're using Guten blocks, which are inherently structured. That is very exciting. Okay, in one minute or less, what's the implications? What's next? And um, there's still loads more of us of this for us to do. This is very much step one for us. Um, there's some back and forth with us and Google as we collaborate, uh, quote unquote, collaborate on um, new standards and specs. And we're also expanding this beyond WordPress into Type 3, into big commerce, who you heard from just now, into some of those platforms and systems. But the thing I'm really excited about is what we can achieve when we go beyond this. Um, we're already seeing some really nice examples of third parties building on and extending our schema um, and the open source standards to do some really cool stuff. Um, I've got an enormous roadmap that I'm not meant to show you of some really, really awesome things that we're going to do automatically in the background just based on the authoring content. I think the really cool thing is that this might create a world where Google has less power, um, which I'm not going to say. But I think um, it's really interesting that what Google has a really huge competitive advantage on is crawling and passing and extracting content out of the web. If everything is suddenly marked up and described with rich content and structure and data, then it opens up a gate for other types of organizations and platforms to extract that, to analyze it, to use it. Um, if we're labeling millions of websites differently, we create opportunities for other types of things. It also allows us to think about a web beyond just pages. Why should Google have to go and call and extract all the HTML and CSS and JavaScript on the page if we've already described the key information? If our websites are now just essentially APIs and data warehouses for the things that are about, that enables a whole new world of all sorts of cool stuff. That is me. I appreciate that was a lot to take in and very, very quickly. If you want to learn more, there's some really cool stuff here. Go check out schema.org. Go check out our API documents and the open source information we've put for those business cases and messes. Go check out Google's documentation on all the types of things you can mark up. And then if you want to really meta, go and look at schema.org on GitHub, where you can contribute to schema.org itself and expand the standards and take it even further into the future. Thank you very much, everybody. Well done for surviving that. Um, enjoy the rest of the sessions. Guys, for your comments and uh, coming after Tom Whistling. As an e-commerce manager, you want to stop spending money on expensive ads. OmniConvert Explore helps you improve conversion through A-B testing, personalization, and surveys. Understand that growth is also a matter of retention, not only acquisition. With OmniConvert Reveal, you'll understand segments, monitor customer experience, and nurture your customers on every channel.